Okay, so good morning. We're going to begin, so we have also some time to uh, have some discussion after the presentations, uh, in which I want to I really appreciate the organization of this great event, all the visits that we have been able to, to have, and also to be here in the, with the table, in which we have three, uh, let's say, different scales, and uh, also three people coming from different backgrounds, so that is architecture, uh, it is uh, the political background and also the importance of the communication. What we were speaking this morning before in the other uh, uh, table about dialogue, I think is something that we also have uh, to really uh, reinforce. But it's also about different scales, so we will be having a presentation by Pirio Sanaxenajo, who is a practicing architect in uh, Helsinki, and we will be seeing in the scale of the city, of the neighborhood, some of her uh, or their the, the company's uh, projects and designs uh, within the built environment, within the built city, uh, in, uh, in some heritage uh, context. We also have with us uh, Monsieur Patrick Rimbert, who is, uh, has been the mayor of Nantes, but he has also been involved in the city uh, involve, uh, involvement and also construction, transformation, and uh, transmission and communication with its, uh, with its inhabitants uh, for many years. And currently, he is the president of the Agency of Urbanism of the bigger uh, region of uh, Nantes. We also have Ansi Zegle, who uh, I did not know before, uh, but I was, uh, I liked one of his uh, sentences when we were communicating before on asking uh, what his background was. He has been communicating, he's a communicator, he teaches at the university, and he says that he teaches students how to communicate. So this, which seems like very basic and very essential, is something that I really believe uh, is, is still very much necessary uh, in many of our fields. Um, so uh, we will be also speaking about his experience with architecture and heritage through uh, the expo in uh, Shanghai, in which he was uh, representing uh, Latvia, but uh, mainly his uh, focus on uh, the issue of communicating. I myself uh, am here uh, invited uh, representing the Mies van der Rohe Foundation in uh, Barcelona a public institution which uh, has its headquarters in the pavilion, in the German pavilion that originally Mies built in Barcelona. And as you know, it is a reconstruction, so it's not the original 1929, but it's the reconstruction built in 1986, exactly in the same place, but materials, absolutely everything is new. Uh, but it's still, uh, although there is a criticism, there has always been a critic to this uh, reconstruction, uh, it allows people to visit something which for many years was in people's minds, but not in reality, once it ha was dismantled. And that through the foundation, there's also the organization of the European Union Prize for Contemporary Architecture, the Mies van der Rohe Award, uh, which was settled in 1986. So we already have a series of examples of uh, architecture, which in some cases uh, it's being discussed about, uh, even if only 27 years have passed, their importance within their cities, within their landscapes and so on, and uh, maybe also about being pieces of uh, really new heritage. We saw or we heard before about the Oslo Opera House, which has been listed by the Norwegian government as also a piece of heritage, and it's a really uh, new building, so time uh, with enlisting and heri understanding heritage is also uh, changing. Uh, so it's interesting also to have people who uh, have built buildings which have been listed to know their opinions on uh, how they would react towards transformation of their own buildings or, uh, or changing or even demolishing and substituting it with other pieces. I believe that some buildings around the world are renowned internationally for their uh, unusual architecture and or their social uh, involvement. Uh, many 20th century and contemporary architecture was not built for eternity, uh, but we are normally or usually kind of really marveled by the fact that these constructions remain standing as a legacy and history for the future, for the, uh, our future generations. 
but many of these buildings, uh, 20th, uh, basically second half, uh, have been built with experimental techniques. So non-durable details, standard products that sometimes no longer exist uh, today anymore, uh, construction quality and comfort requirements which are inadequate by today's standards, and even works from the 90s, for example, in which fire regulations, security issues, uh, and so on, have also changed, and so they would not be possible nowadays. So contemporary architecture uh, works with the large numbers, with the large scale, with uh, sometimes we could also say social production or industrial construction uh, methods. And there's a significant separation of functions in many cases still today, which requires a different view regarding authenticity and original materials, and above all, it needs a different approach in its transformation. Can we talk about real architecture, physical conditions, make the restoration as synonymous with the construction of a replica? Regarding modern movement architecture, for example, we have a series of examples. You have the Zonestral uh, in Hilversum, the Van Nel factory, that's also in, in Rotterdam, or the Tuzenhut house, which are case studies of buildings that no longer have their original uh, use as factories, as a hospital means, or as a, a house. So can a building built for a particular use actually acquire a new use and a new life? Does this make justice to the architectural significance of its initial uh, creation? I would like to highlight the difference between icons and the reality of everyday life, because only, in my opinion, the important monuments of uh, modern architecture, contemporary architecture, have enough value to be restored accurately, and therefore, in many cases, with an important large uh, budget. But for the vast majority of 20th century works, there's a different challenge uh, that faces uh, the redesign of these buildings or these uh, designs through the application of freedom and creativity in its transformation. And just to finish before we begin with video, um, it can be functionally and economically uh, attractive to adapt a tailored building, like most of the buildings that uh, we see that have high qualities uh, in different aspects, to new circumstances so that it can have a new period of use and that the emotional, cultural, or even historical aspects of the building outweighs their functional or economic uh, utility. We can decide to preserve a building in its original state for future generations, but in the works of modern movement and contemporary architecture, this may seem paradoxical. The celebration of the new obviating uh, the old can involve not being interested in something new when it becomes old. So the restoration would shorten the freedom of future generations. In any case, I think that tailored studies regarding heritage are in each and every one of the cases uh, absolutely necessary. So, Pirio, I would like to introduce you. Hello everybody, my name is Pirjo Sanaksenaho. I come from Helsinki, Finland. So my background is in architecture, I'm architect, uh, and I have a practice together with my husband, Matti Sanaksenaho, and I also work as professor of building design at Aalto University. Aalto University is a multidisciplinary university. It was founded five years ago on base of University of Technology, University of Business, and University of Art and Design. And nowadays, Department of Architecture is part of the School of Art, Design and Architecture. So thank you for the invitation here. It's an honor to be here. It has been a very interesting conference. So first, uh, some words about our practice, Sanak Senaho Architects. It was founded in 1991. Uh, the, the background is in World Exhibition in Sevilla in 1992. Uh, when Matti Sanaksenaho, together with his student mates, four, four student mates, uh, won an open competition of a Finnish pavilion for Seville World Fair. And, and it was built then, and after that, uh, we found our own office. Uh, the Seville pavilion is an example of a temporary building, which then, after all, still remains. It was designed for six months period of the exhibition and, and it is still there in Sevilla after 23 years. The 
Association of Andalusian Architects bought the building and they have their headquarters there. But unfortunately, the building is quite in bad condition at the moment because all the details were designed for only six months. So sometimes we have a problems also in, in this case. So then we have done quite much uh, private villas. There on the upper right corner is a villa to middle Finland, uh, Villa Musu, which is like a free form building. And then on the lower right corner, there is a villa to China, uh, to Nanjing. It was an uh, international practical exhibition of architecture where 10 architects from different countries and 10 architects from China were invited to design a, a villa for this natural park. So, so uh, maybe the pure materials uh, and sculptural forms are, are uh, much used in our architecture. But the projects <coughs> I'm now going to show are somehow connected to the old environment. So I chose five projects from our, our practice where we have thought these things, how to combine new buildings to old environment. The first is student center in Vasa, Finland. It was the first project we did uh, after graduation when we found our own office. Vasa is a city on the west coast of Finland. You see it on the map on the right. It was founded in 1606. Uh, it has 66,000 inhabitants and the, and the city plan is, is uh, based on the uh, square blocks and straight streets. But there as well, in many, many cities in Finland, the city was quite much demolished in 1960s and a new, uh, new block of flats were built on that time. But we got a commission to design a new student quarter, dormitories and student house to the center of Vasa. There was an old bread factory. This is the site. The old, old bread factory is here marked with one, and then there was an old apartment building out of wood and an office building from 1950s, and we had to like uh, complete the block with new buildings which are marked with red. So we decided to use the original materials, the red brick as in the old factory in this part of the quarter and then wood in this part where is the dormitory. So here you see how we, how we with the scale and the material uh, wanted to combine the new building to old, old uh, apartment building along the street. And there you see the red brick fabric factory, which was used also for student apartments and student restaurant downstairs and student theater. So the public spaces were in the old factory building. So it was more like a public part of the uh, block. And here you see how we how we attach the new building to the old street facade. So just with the materials and the vertical windows. And then in the city of Vasa, there is tradition that you mark the corners of the uh, blocks with some kind of balconies or, or so. So then we interpreted that in a new way in our building as well, in the crossroads. And in the yard side, it was very like a, a social housing and, and the low budget. So, so we tried to make the outdoor spaces also so that the students can use those in sunny days. And this is the red brick part of the dormitory. So it speaks with the old uh, red brick factory building. Then another example is uh, in Helsinki. This is not realized, but, but uh, I thought that it fits to the theme. Uh, there is an old water tower in Helsinki, Linnanmäki. It was designed by architect Gunnar Taukar in 1938, and, and it's totally circle, 
and, and made by red bricks. Nowadays there is amusement park on the hill. Uh, the amusement park was founded in 1952 when there was the first Olympic Games in Helsinki after the war. And then we got a commission to design a hotel to this water tower. So the water tower is not anymore used by the city, so it is empty. So and it's like a landmark, so you can see it quite far away from the city. So we thought that we could uh, heighten it up with two floors made out of glass and then uh, make an inner courtyard into the water tank so that you get the lobby of the hotel in the middle. And then there was in the commission also a spa and, uh, and uh, underground parking so th that we put to the, to the underground. So you took elevators from the foyer of the hotel to downstairs and there was the spa in the caves and the parking and the hotel rooms were in these floors. So the rooms were in, in, in the inner and outer circle and in the middle was the vertical uh, circulation, elevators and stairs. So the changes we made to the old water tank were the windows and then the two floors above the, above the building. And we tried to do the windows so that they don't harm the old building. So we did them with the uh, same color, red brick color, the frames, and also a little like grills side so that the uh, glass, glass is not so, so big part of the facade. So this is, was like the detail of the, of the solution. But then the uh, heritage part of the city, the city museum said, no, you cannot make any holes to the water tank. It's, it's a monument of water infrastructure in Helsinki. And so, so this project didn't go forward. So this was an example how, how uh, the museum people that time uh, prevented the, the reuse and, 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 and I would like to question if it's uh, because now the tank is still empty after 10 years, there is no use in the, in the wa old water tank and, and it's difficult to invent that kind of use where you cannot make any changes to the facade of the, of the tank. Then another unrealized project uh, Tölönlahti, Tölö Bay is a central area in Helsinki. Uh, there is a park and there is uh, some of the most important buildings of Helsinki in the area. There is the Parliament House here by uh, J.S. Siren architect. Then there is Finlandia Hall by Alvar Aalto. There is the National Museum by Eliel Saarinen, Geselius Lindgren Saarinen. Then there is a new uh, music house. And there is the Kiasma Museum of Contemporary Arts by architect Stephen Hall, quite in the same area. You see, this has been uh, uh, under discussion many years. Already Alvar Aalto did a city plan for this area. And finally, uh, during past 10 years, uh, the area has begun be be being built. So there are now the new office buildings uh, uh, it's beside the railroads. Then there is the new music house, which was realized a couple of years ago. Uh, Kiasma by Stephen Hall. Then a headquarter by main Finnish newspaper. And there is a site for a new central library, which was an open international competition also a couple of years ago. There is the Parliament, Finlandia Hall, and so on. Here is the picture of the winning project of the Central Library. It was won by Finnish uh, Office ALA, and it is now, now under designing, and it will be realized in, in 2017, when it's the 100th anniversary of Finnish independence. So we had a commission to uh, design a cultural center to this area and, and our solution was to 
um, put it underground because of all these, these uh, monumental buildings around it. So, so and the and the area area could be used also between those. So we made like a like a shaft to the ground, uh, which was like an ice break or something. Oh. So that you, you can go uh, through the shaft from Museum of Contemporary Art towards the Thurla Bay area and the park. And, and the spaces would anyway get natural light because the shaft was wide enough. And then there was also, also skylights where was uh, water pools above those. So you get very lively natural light in the spaces. But this is so far uh, unrealized because the user uh, has not been found. Maybe people are afraid of underground spaces. Anyway, so, so there has been negotiation of Art University and, and uh, House of Dance, which are going to be built in, in Helsinki anyway. But, but uh, we don't yet know how is it going on. The fourth project is then a student healthcare building in old uh, urban fabric. It was finished in 2010. The Tölö area is an uh, uh, area quite in the heart of Helsinki, which was built in 1920s. And the, and the typical buildings in that area are solid blocks with uh, vertical windows, and they are mainly apartment buildings. Then there are some, some uh, buildings also made out of red brick. And our commission was, this was an invited competition to extend existing uh, student healthcare center, which was built in 1970s. You see it there on the behind. It was very typical 70s building with ribbon windows. It was here. So we somehow wanted to complete the urban space with a new building here so that we make, as it is uh, usually done in Tölö area, that, that the facade is straight towards the street and it closes the street. And there are simple vertical windows in the facade and the material is red brick. And there between the old building and the new building, there will be a shaft where is a staff restaurant. And the new building has this curb wall towards the uh, middle space so that uh, it's more interesting for these uh, old buildings, uh, rooms to wa watch this space. And there is skylight, so it's about like winter garden. So the new building and the old building are not touching each other. There is just this bridge which is connecting those. And this is from the competition phase, the perspective, and this is the inner courtyard with a glass roof. And this is how it was when it was finished. So we wanted to co uh, repeat the tradition of the area of, of simple solid block with vertical windows. And this is how it fits now to the street. There is an old hospital of Tölö made out of red brick also beside. And the windows in the brick wall, they were uh, put to the surface of the brick so that it's like just a film on the, on the surface so the main window is inside and this is just like a glass plate um, making it like one one solid surface and the entrance to the new healthcare center was in the middle of the new building and an old 70s building uh, through this glass foyer And we also used uh, copper in some parts, for example, the entrance to markets, like a, 
and, and then we did the details quite carefully. This is like repeating the form of the building, the main door handle. And there is this airy shaft between the new, new uh, curve walled brick building and the, and the old uh, building. And here you see the staff restaurant there in between the spaces. And those uh, window plates we put because of the acoustic. So to the old, old uh, building, we added those in order to get better acoustics to the staff restaurant. And they are working quite well. And, and, and people can also uh, have a shade and, and to the care rooms with those, as you see here. And then the bridges, glass bridges, are the only elements which connects these two buildings. And from the bridges, when you go across to the new part, you can see the ur urban structure of the area. Then the last project I'm going to show you is a chapel in Turku. This was invited competition in 1995 but it took 10 years to be realized. There, there was a financing gathering for so long. Um, Turku is, is the oldest town in Finland. It's the closest town to Stockholm on the southwest corner of Finland. Uh, it's a medieval city, though the, the city structure from medieval times is not, is not anymore existing because there has been many fires in the city. Uh, but the Turku Cathedral is part of the oldest city and, and it has been built in many phases. The oldest part are from, from uh, 12th century and, and the style has changed during the uh, building process. So it was first like a Roman church and then, then it got some Gothic styles and, and finally in 19 uh, or in 18, uh, 1900 the top of the tower was built, made by architect Carl Ludwig Engels design. And we got a commission in the competition to design a new ecumenical chapel to Turku. And Turku is the, uh, like the city where the Christianity came to Finland. So it's the head capital of the church. So, so we thought that what kind of church, new church can we do there? And, and the idea was that it, it should be ecumenical, so, so all the different churches could use it, Orthodox and Catholics and, and Lutherans, etc. So we went back to the roots. We thought that the pre-Christian time there was fish was the symbol of uh, Christians. And, and on the other hand, we were interested in the tradition form of the church, of the Western church, how it is situated on the site. So the site which we had was a little hill, so we placed the new building to its uh, totally like uh, from west to east, southwest uh, coordination so that the altar is like in traditional churches in the east and the entrance is from the west. And we had a cooperation with an artist, sculptor Kain Tapper, who is famous uh, who was a famous Finnish sculptor. And we had an idea that, the, that the, it's like a unique one material piece and it would be a green copper. These are the competition drawings and model from the designing phase. So that there is only one material outside and one material inside. The interior would be wood. And this is the simple plan of the chapel. So it was a bit like form of the fish, or somebody say that it's form of the boat. The main structure were glue laminated timber uh, ribbons, and there was a simple use of, oh, sorry, first the foyer, and then uh, the service spaces, toilets, sacristy, and stairs to the technical spaces, which are downstairs. Uh, and then there was a gallery space. There was an idea in the ecumenical chapel that there will be held art exhibitions. 
So we thought that like in the old, old Renaissance churches, the art and the ceremonies are in the same spaces. So it's all the one space and the ceremonies are happening here in the front. And there is altar and the natural light is coming only from these windows beside the altar so that actually you don't see, see out, you just see the light. And the structure was simple. Uh, there were the glue laminated timber ribbons made by a ship factory which made wooden boats and they were just cut in different heights so that gave the form to the building. And this is the picture just after completion. So nowadays it's much darker, it's getting a little green and also the surrounding is more green at the moment. And this is the altar end of the chapel. And the skin is like, we wanted to make it like a fish skin. So as, as uh, soft as possible. And this is the altar window. And the entrance, actually it's quite small, the, the entrance uh, end of the chapel, so it, it, people have said that it's a prize when you go in and, and you experience the space that it's so big, though it seems quite little when you come in. And there's a little window above the entrance, so you he see hint of a light when you, when you leave the building. And these are the altar windows. This is the sacristy. All the, all the interior surfaces are out of wood. And this is the ceiling. And the service space is in these boxes. This is towards the entrance. And this is towards the altar. So the narr narrative of the building is that you walk through shadowy spaces towards the light and that you cannot see the source of the light. But that was our interpretation of, of, a, of a modern church in, in old traditions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, when the price, some years ago, uh, one of the first, let's say, projects related with heritage but uh, brought to the European Contemporary Prize was uh, the industrial area of Essen, in which a series of different uh, projects uh, by different architects had been integrating and dialoguing with the existing structures. And at that same time, uh, we also received the project by Chemet of, of the urban development of the Ile de Nantes, the island in uh, Nantes, in which he was setting kind of a, like criteria or opportunities for the future uh, urbanization, transformation or use of that, of that area, which we have uh, finally also been receiving more projects related to that area in the, in the years afterwards. So uh, it's perfect to have Mr. Patrick Limbach uh, present this, uh, this uh, case. Hello. Um, I speak here from the point of view of politician. I'm not urbanist, I'm not architect, and uh, I need urbanist, I need architect, I need more to build the project of my town. So I have a, another problem because uh, I prepare my speech in French. I thought I was a translator and uh, I write just a plain, you know, and I don't write uh, very uh, in great density in English. And uh, I'm obliged to have a translator. It's, uh, it's bad, but it's good because uh, you can hear French and you, I can makes a promotion of the French Institute in uh, Riga. And I have a translator from French in Leiden and from Leiden in English. And uh, I go to the essentials because uh, it takes more time. Sorry, uh, if you can go here. Yes, yes, come on here. Yeah, you, you stay here. Never mind. Okay. Le, 
d'abord, je vais vous expliquer le, le contexte de ce, de ce projet. First of all, let me tell you about the context of the whole project. Nantes, as a metropolitan city, is located at the mouth of Loire River. We also have Saint-Nazaire, a city located at the very mouth. And at Saint-Nazaire, we had a port that was built by the state with the intention to develop a um, uh, shipbuilding industry. And if we talk about Saint-Nazaire, uh, we could uh, refer to it as a decentralized Nantes. And this uh, Nantes metropolis, uh, in a way, uh, is a twin, or t forms a twin cities uh, between the Saint-Nazaire and Nantes. And in fact, uh, this territorial unit has a single development plan, which these uh, two cities, uh, along with uh, other uh, neighboring municipalities, share. And at this point, uh, there are 600,000 people in Nantes. And the historic part is located in the nor northern part of the city. And uh, then uh, it also moves in a way towards the south. And we are trying uh, to balance uh, this uh, historic part of the city with the need to ensure transportation between east and west and south and uh, north, which is quite traditional for cities that are located on the banks of uh, rivers. And uh, I will focus on the project uh, which was implemented in the southern part of Nantes. So we can see the general picture uh, on the map. And of course, we met uh, with uh, several um, challenges as we went on with the project. Here you can see the Isle of Nantes. And if we look at the river uh, Rouar, uh, of course, it divides the city. And, and therefore, several islands uh, have been formed uh, within the city. But many of them no longer exist. And Nantes was in a situation where it had uh, the river banks. Uh, without any water running in the river. And therefore, from the city urban planning point of view, it was very difficult to actually 
perceive the city uh, as a whole, but at the same time, this unique situation also accounted for its specific situation. And altogether, we could talk about three parts of the city. In the 19th century, this first part mainly uh, accommodated um, um, the port. Then there were also suburbs uh, nearby the harbor. And this part was uh, the one that uh, was mainly developed during 1970s. Mainly, here we are talking about office buildings and residential buildings. And it was in 1987 when the shipyards were closed down. And uh, since that time, uh, the identity and the industry of Nante, in a way, was disrupted. And it was in 1989 when uh, elections were held and uh, also discussions uh, were held in order to determine uh, what will be the future of the city. Should we remove all the remains, uh, remaining parts of the harbor, or should we keep them? So the dilemma is whether, whether to wipe out all the remaining uh, infrastructure and make a nice park or do we think about any other approach that could be appropriate for the island? And at that time, uh, Jean-Marc Marot became the mayor of the city, and I was working for his team. And in fact, the first uh, large-scale project that we wanted to implement uh, uh, was located within the very center of the city. In order to improve the functionality of the center, and not only for the, uh, from the perspective of the traffic of the cars, but also for the pedestrians. And in the following five years, uh, we addressed architect Perrault, who at that time uh, was working on the new National Library in France. And we approached him uh, with our uh, project. And uh, we asked him uh, what uh, considerations should be taken into account before we go on with the project.
On one hand, he said that uh, there are no specific considerations. On the other side, there are still there are, there still are some. And in the first six years of the project, uh, what we did was. Uh, invited uh, specialists of, uh, in the area of cultural heritage to discuss various approaches. And in this initial phase, we invited uh, specialists from theater, from arts, from various uh, walks of uh, life. Uh, and we invited artists to perform in these uh, abandoned buildings in uh, Nante Island. And uh, on one hand, uh, this gave us an opportunity to learn about uh, the arts and uh, various, um, various performers from different parts of the world. Or on the other hand, it also gave us an opportunity to actually use these abandoned buildings. And in a way, it was the culture uh, which was uh, used as an icebreaker, uh, which allowed to introduce these uh, abandoned uh, buildings to local residents. So on one hand, uh, it was a great opportunity to explore this area, all these buildings. And on the other hand, the city planners uh, got a better understanding on, on how to go on with the project. And uh, the city planners um, uh, looked at this uh, formation of three islands as a single unit. Of course, we also explored the, the experience of other cities such as Amsterdam, Hamburg, uh, etc., uh, because it was quite trendy to build up uh, the areas very close to the banks of uh, rivers and to use uh, the embankments uh, as much as possible. But uh, the unresolved issue was what to do uh, with the inner parts of the island. And then the municipality announced a call for proposals uh, for the implementation of this project, taking into account the vision of the city planners regarding its future development. And uh, in this uh, 
uh, call for proposal. It was Alexander Shemetev, an architect who uh, was the winner and uh, he was given the opportunity to implement our project for the following 10 years. And here we have uh, the numbers uh, pertaining to the project. Uh, we can see the areas. Uh, and in a way, this summarizes what has been done during this decade of implementing the project. On a amené les gens uh, sur l'île de Nantes. On a amené des projets. And I must say that we are quite satisfied with the outcomes of the project because now uh, this island is very much accessible for the local people, unlike it was before. Here you can see the historic part of Nante city. And everything that you can see in this picture was um, um, built in the 18th century. Then we built a pedestrian bridge across the river that leads to the island. And uh, this uh, footpath uh, also led to the newly built justice court designed by Jacques Nobel. And this uh, justice court uh, is located in the very center of the Nante Island, and it is a very important landmark. It was a lengthy struggle because the, at the national level, the decision was to locate this uh, courthouse uh, elsewhere. Nevertheless, uh, we managed to put it exactly at the place where this footpath uh, connects the island with the mainland. So now it is the central landmark of the island. And as I mentioned, uh, this bridge directly leads to the uh, justice court, uh, but of course, not everyone and not uh, on every day goes to the court. However, this bridge, along with uh, all the newly built uh, um, constructions and buildings, uh, attract people to the island uh, not only because of the courthouse. And Alexander Shemeto uh, offered here uh, a twofold. Um, solution on one hand it was an opportunity uh, to work on an, uh, a single uh, area uh, in order to ensure public space while also uh, exposing all three main layers of the island's history De l'envie, c'est l'espace du projet qui, s'il est de qualité, vont amener tout naturellement les gens à investir, à construire, à vouloir habiter 
et euh, etc., etc. Of course, the public space is uh, at the place where people meet, where people communicate and interact. And of course, um, having such um, public space uh, further develops uh, also the, the willingness of people to invest or to find a place of business or place of residence within this area. Il n'y aura peut-être pas besoin de, 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 de traduction pendant un petit moment, sauf si je le demande. And now I will show you a couple of slides uh, where we will have an opportunity to compare what was the situation before and how it looks now. Avant. Here we can see how this uh, the place looked before the implementation of the product. This is the shipyard. So the whole area was dedicated to building ships. And of course, it was very difficult to decide what to do with such a site. sont là, nouveaux usages que je vous expliquerai tout à l'heure. And uh, this uh, shipyard was uh, replaced uh, with uh, structures for totally different purposes. De la structure métallique. Bet architectrisinājums bija fakt Nevertheless, uh, the uh, metal parts, the framework of the structure was retained. And uh, now there is a passage uh, through the building. Cultural, autre. And at, uh, at this point, uh, from shipbuilding, uh, this building has, to, has turned to the area of culture and house to different various cultural projects de tous les acteurs de la ville faktiski pilsēta attīstības projekts īstenībā pārta pa par visas pilsētas attīstības projekts and uh, this uh, regeneration of this island and uh, in a way just a certain part of city in a way acted as a, as a catalyst for development throughout the city and in this case the the architect took into account all the challenges that uh, we were facing in this particular area. And I, I would say that we, as the city council, uh, gave the architect all the necessary means to successfully implement his vision so that uh, the architect is able to offer us something totally new that matches our needs and the needs of our citizens. Also, here we can see the before and after uh, comparison. Donc ici, c'est du logement social. In this building, uh, this building houses social apartments, or in a way, it is a social house. And we are sometimes criticized uh, that uh, the municipality refused to offer these apartments uh, in the general market because uh, the demand was very high. And nearby, we also have a school. And this mechanical elephant, uh, there is a separate story behind this elephant because uh, Nantes is the hometown of uh, Jules Verne. Galatrava, leur tour, la tour Europa, Jean Nouvel quand on est riche, Lorenzo Piano, 
et nous nous sommes moins riches. Nous avions plein de projets, donc on a fait un appel à projets et on a dit qu'est-ce qui va caractériser un peu ce projet unique et, et, et attractif. If we look at uh, several um, European cities, uh, we can see various uh, uh, vertical landmarks such as uh, such as skyscra skyscrapers uh, designed by Jacques Novel. However, our budget was um, um, much smaller, and uh, in a way, uh, we managed to implement uh, our vision of our city through. Uh, introduction of cultural element. Dans le concours, qui remporte le concours, ce sont des machines de Jules Verne. And uh, this project was also implemented as a result of a uh, competition, and as a result, uh, a mechanical. Uh, Elephant uh, was made based on uh, the works of Jules Verne. And these gigantic uh, mechanical robots uh, are constantly uh, built and uh, introduced to the people and visitors of Nantes. Et ça, c'est tous les projets qui sont venus, qui euh, l'université des industriels, des start-up qui ont voulu venir sur ce site. And on uh, this map we can see all the projects that ha have been implemented and uh, they cover a lot of areas. Either it's about uh, higher education, we have business incubators, we have uh, various creative industries. Here you can see the University of Arts. Also, we have uh, a hotel. And it all is situated in the previously degraded areas. And here we can see the difference between 2005 and uh, some time later when the project was completed. Sorry. Uh, um, new architecture school before, after. Uh, an old industry foundry. Somebody told me that I must keep something here, but I must protect this, uh, uh, this thing. So we make a concourse. We know that we want a garden here, and uh, we keep all the structure, and we make a garden under the structure. After, in the old, uh, in the old neighborhood. Now the, it's a building on uh, Blokos, built during the war for a new uh, music, emergent, emergency music, some uh, uh, manage machine, dragon, who was at Pekin, in Pekin, uh, last uh, summer. Last, uh, just a second here. It's a banana hangar. And uh, we have coffee, uh, all sorts of coffee, or uh, t-shirt, and so on. But here, many po you can see many people along. We, we have uh, an artistic uh, production, and we keep in just in the middle about uh, 3,500 square to make exposition of arts. 
between uh, two pubs or three pubs or uh, something like that. And it's uh, how do you say a piège? Slast. That's both Latvian and Slast. And uh, the man opens the door. He finds somebody who explains him what is, what's that. You have, uh, by example, uh, an exhibition here uh, of Varini and the uh, heart project transformation project built a new project and so on uh, another story and no time private 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 um, investment from time to time uh, when it's rain it's rain here yeah. but you we have some uh, the sky is red when uh, it's good weather and so on and so on example Patrick and at last thank you and I finish okay. <laughs> sorry uh, a constant communication a magazine you can find some if you want uh, Angar you can read a website here partner promenade workshop <laughs> workshop with uh, the cities uh, because uh, you, you need that uh, employers or uh, works with the uh, urbanist children a panel of uh, neighborhood uh, of not explaining and talking about this project and now the Southwest Metamorphose, Public Hospital. Thank you. I was too, <laughs> too long. Thank you very much. We've been seeing the cultural heritage of languages, architectural languages, what we are speaking about. And Marianne, for example, was speaking before from Snohita about this uh, way that architects would communicate, which is physical. So maybe it's a way to introduce also uh, Ansi Zegel uh, and well, his expertise on communication. Yes, yes, please. Ah, the Okay, good morning everyone. It's still morning. Um, my name is Ansi Segle. I've been working in the, the field of communication for more than 20 years. And um, what you see behind me on the screen, this is a building I were brought up in a sense, or figuratively speaking. This is a building of my, um, I would say, first of the few important schools I was attending to. This is the building which is almost 200 years old. And this is a building of uh, Riga's Design and Art School, where I am teacher right now as well. And uh, this is important for me, if we are speaking about the context of uh, preservation of um, architecture and uh, legacy, that this building taught me a lot about how important it is to preserve history and how important it is to communicate it, it to be successful, because uh, this is really a bright example of the way how to make things happen and probably mo most of you know that already but um, it is scientifically proven that uh, lack of communication is disrupting families on a like let's say basic level of society and if we extrapolate it a little bit bigger the same goes for uh, us as a society as a family in order to live and prosper in a good condition, we need to communicate whatever we are going to do or whatever we are thinking about. And this particular example of my um, school and especially the process of uh, preservation and process of renovation, which took almost uh, 13 years altogether from the inception of the concept that it has to be preserved up to the finished school and actually last year it was uh, praised in a local architectural comp uh, competition as the best preserved building here in Latvia. I would like to say that um, the way how it was made and not 
communication in a sense of speaking about it, but communication in a sense what you are doing in order to achieve your goals to preserve such a building and how to organize all that. And uh, it's, it's worth to, worth to uh, look into that detail much deeper. We do not have enough time as of today, but those of you who are interested, I, I would really suggest to, to check this, uh, this example. And uh, my, my presentation is rather short. I would just like to know a few really important and successful cases, and unfortunately there is still a lot of cases where communication or rather lack of it uh, make sense and make people and society at large <clears throat> really disappointed. Um, another example, there is uh, just uh, one of the school nearby as well, beautifully preserved and it was part of, uh, part of our school back in the days. And this is just a small cafe somewhere uh, in the, the far, far coast, west coast of Latvia in Pavilosta. And this is Saldus Art School, which is kind of a new building, but as well uh, the way how they, uh, how they communicate it and how long does it take, it's really a great example of contemporary architecture, on the contrary. And uh, my biggest experience actually was uh, more than six years ago when I became part of a team of uh, participation of country of Latvia in the World Expo in Shanghai in 2010. And honestly speaking, this was one of the harshest experiences I ever had, not only in terms of uh, process itself, but as well of communication and how communication regarding the architecture was, uh, wasn't used in the right way and was rather h harming the project as a whole instead of probably if it would be done right from, uh, from uh, involved stakeholders, that would be a much better experience. And, uh, all this, uh, when, I, when I just reflect on, uh, on how it happened, that uh, leads me to think, and actually the general experience as well, what we are seeing right now in, in Latvia locally, and especially it, cons it is concerning the new buildings, uh, a lack of communication definitely are damaging public perception of architecture as such, and generally, uh, I would say, as a concept of what can be preserved like within, I don't know, 200 years or 300 years. I'm not sure whether your next colleagues will be fighting for to preserve such a buildings or preserve New York as it stands or Chicago or, or Shanghai. It's really a big question, but definitely uh, there's a few projects uh, in Latvia, which is as of uh, like last 10, 15 years, where I see that lack of proper communication really on the first hand damages uh, public image of architecture as such. And the other hand, of course, uh, it kind of creates understanding which uh, goes through deeply in society that all those, uh, all those buildings are nothing more than just uh, somebody's interests making, uh, making a reality despite public opinion or what public could like, let's say, think about it. And unfortunately, that goes for uh, not only uh, like business projects, but for, let's say, Latvian National Library, which was uh, completed last year. Finally, after a struggle of more than 20 years, back and forth, back and forth, um, uh, the library is um, made by our famous architect, Gunnars Birkerts. And I would say this is as a symbolic value. It definitely st will stand for, uh, for a long period of time, but uh, the everything around the process itself, it really damaged even that probably building which could be beautiful. And uh, one of the brightest examples of, um, of interests and probably of not such a good quality of communication about architecture was uh, AB Concert Hall, which is uh, not yet built and probably will never be built, not, not, not uh, far from here on the river. And uh, the whole thing, how it happened, it really damaged, again, as I said, uh, the understanding of what architecture can do to the society, how it can change society, and how it can make places be like, I don't know, Bilbao or any other place where you know a lot better than me what architecture can do to the biggest, uh, bigger, bigger value for the, for the local societies. Unfortunately, here in Latvia, um, 
this is probably because of uh, certain uh, cultural heritage, which we have uh, like when we were oppressed for more than 50, 50 years by Soviet Union, and it's still this, uh, this spirit somehow takes us over, and especially if, if it's concerning the big, uh, big infrastructure projects such as uh, great quality of architecture. That's probably it from me right now. We'll have a short discussion, and uh, thank you for listening. I would like to maybe begin, and uh, as you're here also, uh, by this issue of communication. And as you were saying, it's a lack of communication, or is it also a uh, lack of know-how of architects who in many cases the, think they are the or we think that we can really organize the interdisciplinary groups which are uh, part of a heritage reuse or transformation and so on and that we can transmit we can connect all the people that are involved in such a project and even transmit that to uh, politicians and to the social uh, I mean the, the inhabitants of cities yeah, what I think is the, the most important part is uh, not being, uh, let's say, inactive, but being proactive in the field of communication. Meaning that if you have an idea, you, you have something to say, you need to be uh, more active than you would be normally in normal circumstances, especially if you would like your project to be moved forward. And um, what, I, what I learned as well is that uh, proactivity and especially I have plenty of friends who are architects. I'm, I'm in that field somehow, and I know that uh, they're great guys, but uh, they're kind of up to themselves most of the time. You know, they are not trying to, so to say, as we speak in communication, to sell their idea, to sell their project. They have to be much more, let's say, dedicated in, and involve people much more around it to make it happen. So that's my experience, and definitely proactivity from the interest, uh, interested party would be uh, of benefit for everybody. And proactivity has maybe been more possible or existing through uh, heritage examples and so on more than with yeah, contemporary? Yeah, that's what I said about the uh, Riga's design and art school project. Definitely uh, the activity came from the, from the owners of the project, from the architects, and that's, that was the way how they communicate. They established uh, NGO organization dedicated for preservation of this uh, building and then it took uh, I guess more than uh, more than 10 years to make it as a project and then later on three more years to, to complete it so you know never <laughs> never give up I would say definitely that's the that's the learning from it do you want to add something to this issue? If not, I had another one, and then we can also communicate, all of us, uh, together. But it was one of the points that we received in the joint statement that was organized through after the previous conference, uh, in which there's one of the points that says that to ensure a harmonious environment and to avoid conflict uh, situations, contemporary architecture and design should respect the specific qualities and the typical spatial relationships of the area, the scope and nature of construction. I was uh, well, kind of thinking about two of the words that appear here. One was conflict. Uh, we kind of tend to speak about uh, tensions, tensions which can bring or constraints or uh, uh, opposition from some of the people involved in processes and so on, uh, which can also generate new ideas and uh, this kind of resistance can bring uh, better uh, results, let's say. And the other one is about respect. Is it respect or is it a way to understand? And I wanted to know a little bit, uh, well, through your experiences, this issue of conflicts, which I am sure that they appeared in non, they probably appear in projects, or also respect and how respect can be understood and how dangerous it can be if we use these words maybe uh, in a very general way. I think that the conflicts appear if there is lack of information. So I think it's important that the, all, the, all the participants will be early enough in the design process. So, so the citizens and the users are early, early enough uh, aware what is going to happen. Of course, after that, maybe we can't avoid all the conflicts anyway, but, but I think that's the way how to solve it. No, definitely. Uh, that that goes the same for the proactivity. You know, to involve all the stakeholders at the earliest stage possible, 
and then it, there will be less conflicts and less tensions. That's what I see. There is always conflict, but uh, the conflict could be uh, good at least, because each point of view must, we must share, each point of view, each uh, uh, an architect or an urbanist, and between two architects, <laughs> and between two urbanists, uh, and so it's good because uh, where is the conflict? Is uh, in the intellectual property? of the architect, of the builder, of the paysagist? Or um, is it between two respects, you know, the respect of people, but the provocation of the people too? We must give freedom, of course. But freedom is, give, is, is easy when it's a long discussion change, you must organize this vision. Uh, and at least when the success is here, everybody was right. I told you, I told you nothing. Uh, but it, it's, I, I think, we, we, I am a politician, and I assume, but uh, I must organize this conflict, this exchange, this pro-action. And sometimes I must choose between uh, inhabitants, between architect, between promoter, between project, between my own project. But uh, I think time is very important. Organize the timing, it's a good timing. Organize a good <coughs> exhibition. When I told you no thing during 10 years, no, the most important during 10 years, see in other countries, discuss, uh, have discussion, debate, uh, give an importance to the, to, to, to the island of Nantes, and uh, of other projects the same, but have a, a vision and uh, who built this big, who built this vision? Not us and public policies and goals. Uh, you give the answer. Everybody here gives the answer. And uh, our own responsibility is to decide at the point. We have a project and we have a program because our life is six years and the time of the projects is more. We start projects, uh, we never see. I, I'm lucky because I was 25 years <laughs> in, uh, in the municipality of Nantes. But, uh, Conflict is not, uh, is not a ba bad idea. Everybody, you, you, you tell to before, everybody must be proactive. You must be, be proactive. Not only to say, uh, I know. Everybody knows, not the same thing. And our goal, our responsibility, is to share. It's nowhere. Mm -hmm. No knowledge. Uh, sorry, I'm too long. No. But uh, I, I think we can win. We can win when we know where we go. Time has also gone by quite fast, and it's already one. I'm not sure if there's any questions from the audience. There's one over there. Yes. Can I? Uh, hello, my name is Yuris. I study history here. And uh, Rimbert, Mr. Rimbert, uh, from your discussion, I hear you're a politician because of your this moment last speech. Uh, you do it very well, but the project that you did in Nante was very long. How did you provide that it would continue in the way you saw it? Because 
you get into council only for four years, right? That's the same as in here. So how, how did you provide that somebody would not simply come into council and say, you know, we change it? Did you start some public conversations, make some agreements, make some documents? How did you provide the continuation of the idea of preservation? Um, we are never sure. But I think now, 20 years before, the majority of inhabitants thought so uh, it's a nightmare when it's shut. Nothing and built some, something new. I think now it's the, in the spirit of Nantes. It's not my, I'm not the owner, it's a collective. Uh, project and of course new condition economic condition and so on transform things we have new new deal in the 20 year 20 years but uh, we never sure we never sure but I think we have the memory books uh, discussion promotion. We have um, bases and we can't, we, we, we can, you can't break this bases. You see, now it's the owner of non-inhabitants. We are not the owner. We must just uh, decide the future. But we don't know. We don't know for tomorrow. We just prepare for tomorrow. Sometime we see tomorrow. And uh, in 20 years, I don't know if uh, I will be here. So uh, before ending, uh, I would like to introduce Mr. Dr. Dr. Uwe Koch, uh, who will present the, the, the German Cultural Heritage Committee giving information on the 2018 uh, European Heritage Year that will take uh, place in Germany. So I would like to invite you and also to excuse some of you who have to leave. Thank you very much. Thank you very much that I have the chance to, to speak a little bit about that uh, idea of not um, only an idea, I think it's this very concrete uh, project. Um, I think let us looking forward um, for a new project. We have heard something about the importance of the European Monument Protection Year yesterday. The success of the old Monument Protection Year is certainly the first important argument for a new European Heritage Year in 2018. However, it is certainly not the only one. The most important new, uh, next argument is maybe that cultural heritage may today be seen and also be experienced from a totally different point of view. With the European unification advancing to heights rarely expected in 1975. Cultural heritage may nowadays serve uh, one identifying element throughout Europe. This is a potential that seems ever more important in the current situation, in which Europe is too often only limited to questions of common financial and economic market. Moreover, such a viewpoint also brings a number of new opportunities for the identification, development and conservation of Europe's heritage itself. The European Cultural Heritage Label is such an example. When it focuses on themes of cultural identity, that are relevant to Europe's history from a broad perspective. 
Moreover, not only have the perspectives on Europe's culture changed, also have the challenges for Europe's cultural heritage transformed. Let me just name a few of today's, the climate change and its direct indirect impacts, the distinct demographic development or the one go ongoing migration, or the new habits of utilization, which ranges from new uses of for buildings, monuments, possibilities connected to digitalization. I think a new European Cultural Heritage Year may help to discuss and to develop above all also to share ideas and solutions to the European challenges. A further argument is the underestimated social and economic value of cultural heritage. Cultural heritage is not just an irreplaceable repository of knowledge, but it is also a highly valuable resource for economic adversity as well as social cohesion. The European Union has called in a number of different ways for an increased and enhanced use for the resource. Uh, European Cultural Heritage Year must be, may be a key tool to foster such a development. Finally, let me add a personal commitment why I believe it is time for another European Cultural Heritage Year. After 1989, I had the luck to grow up at a number of different places in Europe and I have to had the chance to visit many parts of European heritage for myself. I think it is the greatest luck for our generation to live in a unified Europe. I, yesterday I saw uh, Riga and when I see other cities, Tallinn, Vienna, Visby, um, Brück, London and so other parts of, of Europe's um, very important cities, I have the experience of European cultural heritage in, and its fundamental common values. Thus I uh, have had the possibility to experience and discerns that in Europe culture or respectively its heritage is never solely um, local or a national matter, but is rather a result of European set of ideas. The ideas of the Reformation, I think, was, for example, an occurrence that formed many countries at the same time. It was a European event with national and regional versions. The aspect, however, that Europe is formed by a series of common European events of identity seems, in my point of view, often underestimated and not well understood, even in large parts of my generation. A new European Cultural Heritage Year may give us a chance to re-establish emphatically that Europe is not just the addition of different histories but a history of itself. I hope you understand that it's a great chance to establish such a year and to teach and to organize participation of people about the cultural heritage. Now, I think um, I find your interest and your co cooperation we need your commitment for a new European Year of Cultural Heritage in 2018. And at the last of my little speech, I want to tell 2018 is an important year, 100 years after the end of the old Europe, 100 years after the end of the First World War, and 100 years after 
the birth of a lot of very important new countries in Europe, like Latvia, Estonia, and other uh, states. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, you. thank you all for uh, attending the session, and we will leave it here. Thank you, Mr.